2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is a, a little, bit of, little bit of deviation from the series I've been preaching on the seven spirits of God. Actually, it kind of fits in here, and uh, it, it just kind of fits in with the idea of the spirit of counsel. We learned last week that the spirit of counsel, when God gives you a spirit of counsel, it helps us make our decisions, make our choices in life. Okay, When the Holy Spirit is in us, and I believe the Holy Spirit talks to people. Don't you? I do. I, I hear that. I don't hear it with my ears. I just, I don't, it's hard to describe how I hear it. I hear it in my soul, I guess, is how it is. But I'll hear the Holy Spirit. This morning, this morning, um, I heard a word this morning. And that's what's got me thinking about a little bit different message. And uh, I've been praying about it all morning. This is actually something... Bless you, Melissa. Yeah, this, this is actually something I've taught in, in the past here. Um, and I don't always... I don't normally do this. Go back and bring something and re-preach something again here at Bethel. But every now and then it does help us. It helps me to just kind of remember how things really work in our spiritual lives. We... We live our lives day to day, and all we see with our eyes is the people around us. We see situations around us. We see things around us. What we don't see with these eyes is the spiritual connections, the spiritual work that's going on around us. We don't see the 10,000 angels surrounding us that are, that are there for us and to protect us. We don't see that, but we trust in the Bible that that's where they are. Some people say, I believe in guardian angels. I believe in angels that minister to God's people. And that keep us in the way. I really do. On top of that, I also believe in spirits. I believe devil spirits, evil spirits, seducing spirits, devils, gods, little g, things like that. The Bible calls them evil angels. I believe those are working against us in our lives. And there is always around us every day, there's a battle going on every day for us or let's say for our homes or our, our families. There's a battle going on in this nation. Amen? There's a battle for this nation being fought. And while we like to look at the people on the news and say he's the fault or she's the fault or I'm not voting for this guy, I'm going to vote for this guy. While we like to see that and say that's, that's how it is. If we could just get our guy in the White House, then it would run our way. It, doesn't, it never has worked that way. All the people that I've voted for and help put in office, I don't really see the whole big difference that they made in the country. I understand that there are spiritual forces that are working in this nation and working against what used to be decent in this country. There are spiritual, there, Cameron, there are spirits working that situation in that school. You understand that, then you deal with it on a spiritual level. Okay? In fact, look at that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. And let me see, you cannot fight devils by yourself. You will lose. They will get you. You must be through God. Through God, they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's the word that I heard this morning. When I got up out of bed. I was just getting up out of bed. And I was, it's usually Sunday morning. I'm thinking about, oh, is it Sunday? Oh, man. You know, kind of that. You don't want to get up. And in the process of moaning and groaning and everything like that, that's the word that, that came to me was strongholds. And I don't know, maybe, maybe this message is for you. I don't know why uh, God had had me preach it. But maybe, maybe it would help us to remind us about how things really work in our home, in our church, how they work in our country, how they would work in our lives. Help us to see through the eyes of the Bible... The spiritual war that is going on around us. But he said that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I'll explain what a stronghold is in a little bit. And then he said, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You reading the Bible is the knowledge of God. 
where your mind takes you throughout certain parts of the day, that those wicked places and those wicked things that your mind imagines that you do or this can be done or things that you can think to do against other people or whatever, those things exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And let me tell you something I've learned over the years. In this church, you don't see any statues of Mary or Jesus or Joseph or anything like that. We don't, we don't say, bless God, we don't have idols. I think, however, if we're not careful, we will imagine a God in our mind that is different than the God of this Bible. And that's the God that we would be worshiping. That God will let us do things that the other God, this God, won't let us do. And so on. Does that make sense to everybody? There could be idols in this church house this morning in your heart that no one would know about. On the outside, it looks like you're worshiping God. On the inside, it's a different God. And you're worshiping a carved out image of a God. This image exalts itself above the knowledge of God. In other words, it'll exalt itself over and above what your Bible says. It'll tell you that parts of the Bible are not for you. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry. You can continue this way. You can keep thinking this way. You can keep living your life that way. And that's what that imagined God will do. And there's a re and I'll show you how those I'll show you how that God got to where it is. All right? But anyway, he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, you may not be able to stop the thoughts. You can, however, with God's help, put them in jail where they belong. Because imaginations and thoughts... They're always going to be in this messed up gray thing we got in our head. Always going to be there. What we don't want is for those imaginations to come out to this world. You don't want that. I get, listen, trust me, you don't want that. You do not want all the wild stuff that goes on in your head to be reality for you. You do not want that is against God. So he says, when those things show up, arrest them. Get them off the street. Put them in prison where they belong. Have them being brought captive. In verse 6. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Be vengeful about it. I, listen, I hate these things that I think. I hate this way that I feel sometimes. I hate, hey, hate how what runs through my mind. I hate those things. I'm, God, put them captive. Make them captive. Make them so they don't have reality in my life. Make it so that I don't turn you into this image that I've just carved out in my mind. Make it so that doesn't happen. God will bless that and God will honor that. Can I hear you say amen? amen. So this morning I'm just going to teach a little bit. Maybe teach just some things that I've learned from the Bible. Some things about how strongholds work. Alright? And I'm going to show you that and show you what that is here in a little bit. In Isaiah chapter 26 verse 1. The Bible says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and for bulwarks. Now, we don't, we don't see that around Festus. But back in the old days, you remember how they built a city. If they built a city somewhere, a city was like its own kingdom. And in order to protect the city, what, what would they do? They'd build a big wall around it. And anybody they didn't want to let in, they didn't let them in. So the wall was meant to be a protection against enemies coming inside the city. That only, those walls are good unless you're Babylon or Jericho. What happened to Jericho? The walls fell down. Those people had, at that point, no protection against the power of God. God destroyed their walls. He destroyed their safety. The people of Israel went in and took over that city. It was just as easy as, easy as eating uh, chocolate pie. They went in there and took that city over because God destroyed the walls. It's the walls. Listen to me now. It's the walls that are keeping stuff out. You have, you have on your body, God built a wall around your body. It's your skin. Skin is designed to keep nasty stuff out of your body. If you get like a rip in that skin, like you get a sore or something like that a few years ago, was working over here at the parsonage, we was pulling up brush, 
and I got, I was down on my knees in there, and I didn't realize it, didn't really think about it, but I was just crawling around in a bed of poison ivy. And I don't, me and poison ivy do not get along whatsoever. And what happened was, that pierced through my skin, and that poison got in my skin at my knee, and then an infection got in there, and I'm standing here on a Wednesday night trying to teach church, and I'm having trouble. This leg is hurting me so bad. I mean, it's got streaks going up the leg and everything like that. And I told Lisa, I said, I need to go to the ER. Have them look at this. And they gave me a bunch of antibiotics and things like that, and eventually it cleared up. But God built a wall around my body to protect my body from things that would come in and harm it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Now you listen to me. When God saves you, or when you, when you reach out to God... God wants to protect you. He wants to keep bad things out and good things in. There's a beautiful, beautiful illustration to this in the Bible. I don't have time to even talk about it this morning. But salvation is a wall of protection. Husbands. Husbands. Elder men of the family. You're the patriarch of the family. You've got your children, even your grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren... God uses the man to be the house band, to band everybody together. And it's usually the man's job to provide protection for his family. Does that make sense? Amen. Guys, build some walls. Build some walls. So that nothing on the outside gets in to harm what's on the inside. Alright? But he said salvation is appointed for walls. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy, within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. There he is. That's double witness now that God wants to build walls of protection. Here's what you're hearing now amongst the, the, the singers in Christian music nowadays and some of the preachers that that's, that's, has an influence over people in this world. They're telling everybody, let's just break down the walls that divide all these good Christian people all over the world. Let's just all get along. Pope Francis, right now, has an agenda to try to bring together every religion in the world all together as one. He just met with men like Kenneth Copeland, James Robeson, who has a talk show on TBN, John Arnott, who is pastor of the, one of these vineyard churches up in Toronto, and some of these charismatic leaders, they all sat down, had breakfast with the Pope, and they were all talking about how they were just going to forget about what divided them, and they was all just going to get along. Let me tell you what God said about that. Paul said, Know ye not that he that hath joined himself with a harlot is one with that harlot? That's exactly what's going on today. And I want to tell you something. I love this church. I love the people that God has sent to this physical location. I love those who, uh, just different places in the country and the world, that say, Bethel's our church, you're our pastor. I take that seriously. I really do. We ought to pr protect this church from wolves and sheep's clothing, false prophets, false teachers. My goodness, we take it seriously. We got people in here this morning that are standing ready to protect physically this church house today. Somebody say amen. amen. This, we live, do we have to do that? You bet we do. We live in dark days. This, there are people going in churches that mean harm to that church. And I believe that God wants to protect a church. And it should be the heart of the people. Yes, we want people to come in. Yes, we want people saved. Yes, we want to bring, we want to be a friend to sinners. But not at the cost of breaking the walls down that are meant to protect the people that are already here. Does that make sense to everybody? In a home, it's the same way. Or your individual life. God has means of protecting us. So let me show you how this, how this works. Up there on the screen. You see, like this is the city here. And in the green here could be uh, just you personally. This is you and your life. Or it could be your family or your church or your nation. Okay? I know I'm preaching this morning to people from different countries. In the country of Kenya, I, they, they know it. The, the Muslims 
are coming down from the north in Somalia and they're trying to make inroads into Kenya. You know what they're, you know what the, they're trying to do in Kenya? Same thing they're trying to do in America. Take over. Yeah. Trying to take over by violence, by terror. They're trying to take over. They're going to try it here in America. They're going to, and by, they're not going to go away. They're going to keep trying. And to me, in this nation, it's stupid to have open borders in this country. It's ridiculous. We ought to be building a wall around a defensible wall around this nation to protect its people. But I think there's evil people in Washington that don't want that. And that's why they're letting it go. So then here's what it looks like. Here's, here's what strongholds are. Strongholds, you study this out in the Bible and you'll see it, is an area where the enemy has embedded itself very, very, very close to home. Okay? The area, let's say, um, well, how can, I, how can I define this? Let's, let's think of it like um, in the days of, um, who was that? Hezekiah, when uh, this, this, I think a Sennacherib came against Israel, came against Jerusalem, and he surrounded Jerusalem, and he had established a stronghold there. In other words, nobody could come in or out of Jerusalem, but they had to go by the enemy right there. Does that make sense to everybody? The enemy will always try to build a stronghold in your mind. He'll always try to get a place where you may be weak. And he will try to bring, he'll, he'll find that spot, bring in all of his devils with him. And all of a sudden now, there is something in an area of your life that is a stronghold against you in your life. It is where the imaginations run wild. It is, their, their attempt is to try to get inside of your mind and be like a spirit of counsel to change how you think and to change what you do and how you do things. And to, watch this now, to change who you serve. To change, the, why did Sennacherib uh, enclose Jerusalem? Was it because they had a McDonald's and he didn't back home and he wanted some french fries and hamburgers? Was that what he was after? No. He was after the throne in Jerusalem. Does that make sense to everybody? Ephesians chapter 6 teach us that these strongholds are principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. They will come after us and they will try to establish and build areas where they can become strong in, areas that you are weak in. And everybody sitting here, everybody listening to me, everybody watching, has areas of weakness in. There is always a chink in the armor. It's always like a, 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 a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And isn't that the truth? I mean, yeah, I've, I've seen chain, man, it's big chains. But if it's got a weak link on it, the chain is no good. And that's where the strongholds will try to embed themselves. That's where the devils will try to come in and embed themselves in that. Okay? So everybody follow me so far. Just, I want to try to teach this and take a little time with it, all right? Watch this. In Isaiah chapter 14, look at what... Lucifer wants to do. He said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But who is Lucifer? That's the devil. Amen? Amen? King James Bible. It's the only Bible in the world that calls him right. His name is Lucifer. Even the Satan worshipers know who Lucifer is. It's the Bible scholars that don't believe that anymore, Wayne. He's Lucifer. For thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Listen, he's all about self-exaltation. By the way, let me, let me ask you a question. He said he wants, to, he wants to ascend into heaven. Are there walls in heaven? Revelation chapter 20, 21, 22. There's walls in heaven. And there's 12 gates, one for each of the tribes. And God's, God even wrote in there who could come in there. And who couldn't? Dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and them that lie and other things like that. They're not allowed in. You think they're going to get in? No, God's going to shut the door on them. So you cannot come in here. These are my people. This is my kingdom. You stay out. I don't want you in here. Amen? 
So he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. This is the congregation. This, is the con this church here is the congregation. Or some other church or whatever it is. Those of you watching, this is the congregation. The devil wants to sit and rule over this church. Every day, there's going to be a battle fought for this church. Every day there is. He wants to sit and rule of the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend into heaven above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He said the most high sits on a throne and rules over his people. Just like a king would, the most high does that. Satan wants to be where God is sitting right now. Now ask yourself... Is God sitting in my life? Ask yourself, does, is, does God rule over my, my house, my physical house, my, my place of dwelling where me and my spouse live and our children? Does God sit and rule over my house? Is God allowed to, to run the show in my house? Do my wife and I, do we pray through every situation? Do we seek God's help in this? Are we asking God for wisdom in raising our children? That's where God wants to sit. The devil wants to sit and rule over your family and over your house. Many of the things that you have encountered in life have been exactly that. For that reason. Um, in, our, in our church, in our, in our nation, we, have, we already have a constitution. We don't need another one. We already have good, I think we got good laws in this country, amen? Right. I think we got good laws in this country. There are evil people led by evil spirits who do not want that in this nation. And ultimately, it's going toward the Bible. They want America to be a Bible-less nation. Okay? So you ponder that. Here's another one. Ezekiel 28, 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. Notice that's a capital G in your King James. He's not, he wants to sit on God's throne. I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. He wants to rule where God should be ruling in your life or whatever, He wants to rule in that place, which means kick God out and be in, be in His place. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the same thing. There's a triple witness now of whether or not this is true. He said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth where? In the temple of God. As if we were to just think now that the temple of God is only that building that used to exist in Jerusalem and may yet exist again. If that's the limit of what we think about this, we're, we're cutting it off short. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, What know you not that your body is the temple of the living God? Where does, where does he want to sit? In, in God's seat, in the temple of God. He, and that's your heart. He wants to rule over you from your heart. It's like the ultimate of devil possession. You and I, if we are saved and born again, we believe the Bible... We have God's Spirit reigning over us from our heart. And it is God's Spirit, like that Spirit of Counsel was talking about, that will counsel us and help us make wise decisions for life. Isn't that what we want? Somebody say amen. The devil wants to come in and mess all that up and make us do stupid stuff. To rule over the place where God wants to sit. So he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. How does he get in there? How does principalities or powers or rulers of darkness or spiritual wickedness, how do they get in there? What they have to do is, there's a wall around there, and what they have to do is they have to build a stronghold someplace and start working on that wall. They'll find a place. How did, I don't know if you've ever heard that story, seen the movie 
uh, escaped from Alcatraz. How'd that old boy get out? How'd Clint Eastwood get out of Alcatraz? He found a weakness in the concrete around a vent in his cell. And every night he took some little thing and he just chipped away. Just broke off little pieces of concrete, just like falling off like dust. And over time, he just made a hole big enough for him to crawl through out of. And the rest was him just getting out of there. But he just chipped away at it piece by piece by piece. And you listen to me. You're not so big and tough with God that you don't have an area of your life that the devil knows that if he can just chip away at it and keep going and keep going and keep going that pretty soon he'll be in there. Don't think that it won't happen to this church. Don't think it won't happen to your marriage. Don't think it won't happen to your children, your grandchildren. Don't, it's happening in America. They found the weaknesses of America and they're exploiting the weaknesses of America right now. We're, lose, we're losing this country. But thank God if we lose this one, I got a better one. Amen. Amen. Okay, now watch this. Job 16 verse 12. Job said, I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. His archers compass me round about. He, the, see the compassing there? The, they're circling you. And they're going to set up a stronghold. Uh, he cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. Verse 14. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. Now let me put it in kind of maybe a way that you can understand. Big businesses, large corporations will always try that everything that they do now is on computers. You know what I found out the other day? Sweetie Pie didn't tell you about we had, uh, we used to have our health insurance through Anthem. Anthem just admitted this weekend that they had a breach in their firewall and somebody broke in there and stole names, numbers, medical records, social security numbers from their servers. Let me tell you how hackers work. Hackers work by finding an area, and I don't really understand all of this, how they do it, but I just know this is what they do. Hackers work, let's say, against a bank, or even against the government, or against Sony Pictures. Remember hearing about that? Or some of these companies. Remember uh, Schnooks over here? Got, got their servers broke into, their computers broke into, and they pulled everybody's uh, uh, credit card numbers off there, and they were, they were getting money off of that. And Schnooks had to tell everybody, go get you a different card. Because we didn't protect your data. What happened was hackers found a place that they could exploit. They built a stronghold there. And then they just started electronically chipping away at the wall that was put around your information. And, t and they just kept doing it until they got in. And I don't know that there is a secure place electronically in this world that exist. I don't know that it exists. Because as long as the hackers keep chipping away and trying to break in, eventually they're going to do it. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Now take that and apply it. They'll just keep chipping. Breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. Now look at this. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 5. I read this one day. And I thought, my goodness. By the way, it says evil counsel. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah. Watch this. There's three of them. What does that number mean? That's not the, the Godhead. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. By the way, let's deal with this for a minute. Our eyes set themselves upon something that's not good to look at. We can turn our eyes away. And it'll really just not have much of an effect. We can walk away from it. It's when our eyes set on it again and then again and then again. And you know what's going on? There is a devil out there trying to breach the firewall. Let's say it's 
somebody's property they own or their house or whatever. God said, don't covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor's. You set your eyes on it long enough and what that's doing, that's wearing you down. That's weakening you. And you keep setting your eyes on it. And you, you, after a while, you think, I've got to have that. I've got to have that. I've got to have that. And they're just chipping away. They've built a, they found a, a, a weakness in your life. They've built a stronghold there. And they're just going to keep working on it until they finally get their way in. Look at what happened here. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remali have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us, number one, go up against Judah. Number two, let's vex it. The vexation, we learned that from Lot. Lot was vexed with what he saw in Sodom. It just kept eating at him over and over and over and over again. And I think probably at some point there, there would have been a point that Lot would have said, I just can't take this anymore. Did the vexation have an effect upon Lot's family? His two son-in-laws said, we're not going anywhere. We're staying right here. His wife even though she started to leave Sodom, that had vexed her heart so much, the stronghold was there, she turned around, looked back, and God turned her into a pillar of salt. I believe the Bible. That's exactly what happened. Okay? In other words, vexation is, they just keep cracking away and working and working and working at you until you just can't, you cannot bear it anymore. And then he said, we're going to vex it and then make a breach therein for us. There's a wall... We're going to breach it and then set a king in the midst of it. There it is right there. Black and white. That's how these devils work. They want to, say they, they want to come into this church. They want, to, they want to vex the church. They want to breach the church and get in. So they can set their king up in the midst of it instead of God. One church after another. And I'm talking fundamental churches. One church after another has been vexed and they no longer preach this old King James Bible anymore. Am I right? You know what happened? That happened. Strongholds were put in that church and they just kept chipping away until they broke through. I read, I'm, I'm not even preaching the message yet, it's 12 o'clock. Years ago, I read, it was a Free Will Baptist Minister's chat board about, you know, this and that and the other. And at one of them, somebody had set up a little discussion group called How to Transfer Your Church from the King James Bible to New Translations. And I started reading how these pastors were doing it. Now, there was no discussion group called how to get your church from the NIV to the King James. There was no discussion group for that one. But here's what they said. Pastor, this pastor said, yeah, I took this church. had a lot of old people in it. They wanted to stick that old King James. And he said, I don't like the King James. I like the newer translations. He said, let me tell you what I did. He said, I started preaching there. Kind of let it lay well for a while. And he said, then every now and then I'd say, now a different translation says this. And he said, I kept doing that every, every, every sermon. I'd, they'd have the, I'd have a King James there on the pulpit. But every now and then, in my notes, I'd say, now, the NIV, I like the way the NIV says it here. And he said, I just kept doing that over and over. And it took a, took a while. But finally, I was able to break through and start preaching out of the NIV in that church. They breached. They vexed. They breached. And they set another king in the midst of that church. Okay, that's how it's done. That could be, I, I don't know who I'm preaching this to, why I'm preaching it. That was the word that I heard this morning. And I thought, I'm going to preach it. If God doesn't want me to, he'll beat me up over it later. But I am going to ask God to bless his word no matter what. Okay, so now watch this. This is what they do. They're going to chip away at you. Proverbs 15, 4 says... A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. They will use things to come after you, things, areas of weakness in your life, either the lust of your flesh or the lust of your eyes or the pride of life. 
I could talk about some of these issues this morning. Maybe when it talks about the lust of the flesh. Some people, they desire and crave the touch of somebody of the opposite sex. It, that's not their husband or their wife. They crave that. They want that's lust in their flesh. They want that. Okay? The devil will find that weakness and he'll start building a stronghold. You know, he'll, he'll send over people that will put their hands on you. Or maybe it's lust of the eyes. The eyes like to look on things that eyes shouldn't look at. And the devil will find that weakness. He'll send over a bunch of devils and they'll build, they'll build a fort right there. And while they got that built, they're going to start chipping away. Working on you. Trying to tear your marriage up, tear your house up. Oh yeah, you still might go to heaven. But they weren't after you to begin with. You were just the wall that was keeping them away from your kids. Boy, this stuff's right, isn't it? And, and the pride of life. We get so full of ourselves. And I was teaching in Sunday school this morning. I thank God for my suffering. I thank God for the things that I have to endure. You know why? Keeps me from getting arrogant. Keeps me from getting full, full of pride. And if we're not careful, we can, we can say, Oh, bless God, we've got good doctrine. We've got the King James Bible. We're this, we're that. I don't think anything can bring us down. God will send over a, a whole gang of devils. And just to bring you down, just so he can show you who you're going to trust, you or me. But this is how it works. And they'll try to breach us. And they'll try to get in us. All right? In Nehemiah chapter 4. When the Israelites were, had come back from Babylonian captivity. They, they saw the temple. It was burnt to the ground. And rubble laying everywhere. They saw their own houses. They had been destroyed. And they saw the wall that was around Jerusalem. And it had, it, it had been busted through in several places. It was just, it was after 70 years, it was a mess. They knew that they needed to get in the city. They knew they needed to rebuild the house of God. That was what was in their heart. But they also knew that what good would it do if we rebuild our houses and rebuild our temple if we're exposed while we're doing it? What good would it do to build those things if we don't build the wall first to protect us while we're in there doing our work. Makes sense, doesn't it? Amen. What good, listen to me, what good would it do for you to try to have a good marriage between you and your spouse if you will not first put walls of protection around that? Make sure your wife knows. Make sure your husband knows. Okay? Make sure that that's going on. Walls of protection around you. Because then you can start working on having a good relationship with your spouse. Same thing with family. We're trying to raise decent kids. We bring them to Sunday school. We homeschool them. We do these things for them. We do that thing for them. But if we're not protecting them in the areas of their life, they're exposed, what good will it do? Because they'll come after you. So here in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabians, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, See that? Do you think that Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, do you think they knew where all the secret ways into the city were? Sure they did. They probably put them there. And they figured, we got, we got little places where we dug a hole in. That way if they build that wall back, we still know how to get in there. And so when they saw those guys, when they saw them putting the breaches back together and stopping the breaches, they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Devils do not want you to have... A, how, how can I say this? They do not want you to have strengthened areas in your life that at one time were weak where they can get in. They don't want that. They want to go in. They're beasts. That's their nature. That's what they want. They're going to attack you. And when they, watch this now, when they see you trying to get your life right with God and spending time in your Bible, spending time in prayer, coming to church service, listening to the preaching of God's Word, pulling stuff up on sermon audio and listening to it, when they see you doing that, they will work against you. They will try to hinder you. They'll try to put a stop to it. 
They will do everything in their power. I've seen over the years, I've been pastor of these people, I've seen people decide that we just want to live right. We just want to serve God. We want to work for God. We want to live for God. We're tired of living for ourselves in the world. And they start serving God. You know what they're doing? They're, they may not realize it or not, but God is teaching them how to, how to close up the breaches. And when the devil sees it, he goes on the attack. He doesn't want them to do that. That's his stronghold. That's where he can have an effect in their life. So he begins to torture them and humiliate them and have people to, uh, to go away from them and mock them and even hurt them. Oh, Chris and Tammy, Chris, I mean, he, he, he'll tell you. He decided he didn't want to live for the devil anymore. He wants to live for God. And I mean, it was one thing after another with them. And they're still battling issues in their life. That's the devil trying to keep them out of that book. Trying to keep those breaches open. So that they can get in. Okay? I'm, this is how it works, people. They want to hinder it. They want to, they want to fight against it. Some of these issues. Principalities. Areas of rebellion or pride. Who's going to be in charge of your life? Who's going to be in charge of the church? Who's going to run the marriage? Think about it. Who's going to run the marriage? Who's going to be in control of the marriage? Who's going to be in control of the house? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. Who's going to be in charge of your household? Who's going to, who's going to be in charge of this church and, and decide what direction it's going to go? Who's going to do that? God's going to bless and use biblical authority, but principalities come in through rebellion and pride. Uh, hang on here. It wasn't done. Here's this deal here. Powers. Areas of magic, occult, witchcraft, media, and addictions. Everything that will hold power over your flesh. Some of the music. You know what I've seen with young people. And I've seen, been seeing this for years. They'll sit in church service. And, and be just as nice and polite all, all they can. But the moment that mom and dad start taking away their music. Am I right? That has a stronghold. The music. And the things that they're watching on TV. And the books they're reading. Has a stronghold in their life. And the moment somebody stands up and try to take it away and try to repair that breach, they come out after them, buddy. I've seen it. I've seen it in adults' lives, too. Uh, rulers of darkness, false Bibles, false doctrine, false teachers being brought into a church or brought into a home. Or watch this now. The children learning doctrines that are not mom and daddy's faith. Somebody's going around mom and daddy found a breach in there and if the Jehovah's Witness and the cults are going after the kids how are they able to do that if mom and daddy believes the Bible and then we have spiritual wickedness in high places things like fornication, pornography, sodomy sodomy there's a stronghold in that school and they've got a breach inside of there and the devils are just going in and out at will and let me tell you what you did Cameron, you didn't have no idea you stood against where the breach was. That's why they gave him so much. That, that phrase that he said, seemingly so innocent, I don't understand what the big deal is. Okay? You may not have any intention on harming the beehive that you walk past, but they're not just going to let you walk past. That's what's going on. That's what's going on in our country. That's what's going on in your home. That's what's going on in your life. I'd like to preach a bunch more of this stuff, but to really do it justice, I'll, I, if I was going to worry about the clock, I'd have to rush through it, and I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to put a hold on it right here, okay? And I've got some other things I want to talk about. I may do it tonight. I don't know. I may do it. I don't know. We'll just, you pray for me, and we'll ask God, all right? But I want you to consider this this morning as... God wanted you to hear this. For whatever reason, God wants you to hear it. That's the word. I don't know who it's for. Don't know why it's there, but it's there. And you need to understand that you've got, you still fighting a battle. And you won't be done for a long, long time. I was, I've got a...